the first talk today. I call this talk, the, this reflection, the Mohammedan bean, the secret history of Islam and coffee. And this takes me back to my, my childhood. Now, my father grew up in Pakistan, as my mother did. Uh, my father was actually born during the time of the Raj in British India. And eventually, on his way to Canada in 1971, he spent some time here in the, in the UK studying. But one of the things I remember about growing up in the kind of the anodyne, cookie-cutter suburbs of Toronto, Canada, was on Sundays, we would go to the mosque. Sounds very familiar. Uh, on Sundays, we would go to the mosque in the morning because there used to be classes, and it was the day we were all off. And I remember when we'd, we'd, we'd drive into, we lived in the suburbs, we'd drive into the city, and on the way back, um, as, a, as, a, as a gift to, uh, to the kids, us, who, uh, who had endured that morning at Sunday school at the mosque, we, my father would take us to his favorite coffee shop. Now, in Pakistani culture and Pakistani families like ours, we drink tea. We drink tea in the morning, evening, and afternoon. We drink tea to be happy. We drink tea when we're sad. We drink tea to think. And tea is taken very seriously. Every family has their own recipe, their own mix, their own blend. Do you boil the milk? Do you not boil the milk? Do you add cardamom? Do you add ginger? Do you put in a little clove or cinnamon? Everyone has their own recipe, and our family indeed has its own recipe. And so I grew up with tea being a comforting home thing, but we never brewed coffee at home. Coffee was something that we did outside of the house. It was a social occasion. And so my father would drive up to Mr. Donut, and Mr. Donut was as good as it got in 1979, 1980. And we would have the same thing every week. I'd have a French cruller, and I'd have this beautiful cup of coffee. And I remember the smell of it. It was earthy and rich and bold and oak smelling. And I loved walking into that coffee shop, particularly in wintertime when I would be kind of surrounded by this incredible aroma. And that's where my love affair with coffee began. Maybe it was the company of my parents uh, and the family going out for something sweet and delicious. Um, or, 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 or maybe it was the caffeine, but I was hooked. So many years later, I remember picking up an article that said, that was titled Coffee, the Wine of Islam. And I thought to myself, this is interesting. And it told the story of, of fatwas and Sufis. It told the story of empires and trade. It told the story of coffee houses and Turks' heads. And I thought to myself, this is one of those weird Muslim articles that one picks up from time to time that tries to make everything Islamic. Uh, because, with, you know, maybe there's an inferiority complex or something. I thought, well, coffee, what does coffee have to do with Muslims? It has more to do with the Italians and their cappuccinos, or Juan Valdez uh, and, his, and his Colombian donkey, which brings the coffee down from the, uh, uh, from the mountains. But the more I began to investigate, and the more I began to kind of explore the origins of coffee, the more I realized that the article was truer than I ever would have thought. I was enthralled to read the following words. And these are the words of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jaziri, a 16th century scholar and historian. And he wrote, coffee is the common man's gold. And like gold, it brings to every man the feeling of luxury and nobility. Take time in your preparations of coffee, and God will be with you, and bless you, and bless your table. Where coffee is served, there is grace, and there is splendor. There is friendship, and there is happiness. What I learned was that coffee and Islam share a history that goes back over five and a half centuries. Now, for those of you historians amongst you and... Uh, the nitpicking bookish types. You, of course, are all thinking to yourself, hogwash, coffee started in Ethiopia, of course, and what is Malik on about? Indeed, the origins of coffee were in Ethiopia, and we know the famous legend of Kaldi the goat herder, whose goats uh, ate of the red berry and then jumped around like, 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 like jumping beans, manic. And he didn't, Kaldi didn't know in the ninth century what this was, but then he realized that they had eaten from this red bean, and this red bean, of course, was coffee. But if Ethiopia was where the origin of coffee was, then Yemen was the place where coffee found its soul. 
there's a lot of competing historical narratives on how coffee came to the Yemen. What we do know is that coffee started to be used by the mystics of the Yemen, the Sufis, members of spiritual orders who existed particularly in the Yemen and who in their rituals and their gatherings of, of remembrance of God, of worship of God, particularly late at night, found that in imbibing and drinking coffee, they had sprightliness and vigor and energy to give added oomph to their devotions. Some people say it was a man by the name of Sheikh Ali ibn Umar al-Shadili, who's buried in the city of Mocha. <laughs> I kid you not. In fact, his grave is such an important site of pilgrimage that people from all over the Yemen come to the port city of Mocha to say a prayer to uh, Sheikh Ali ibn Umar al-Shadili and to often drink coffee around his grave as a sign that he was the one who made coffee popular amongst the Sufi orders, the mystical orders of the Yemen. But there's another great story that I want to tell you about. And this relates to another great spiritual master named Ad-Dabahani. And it is said that in 1454, Ad-Dabahani went to Abyssinia, not far from the Yemen, just across the water. And there he found people using coffee. And though he knew nothing of its characteristics, after he had returned to the port city of Aden, he fell ill and remembering coffee, he drank it and benefited by it. He found that amongst its properties was that it drove away fatigue and lethargy and brought to the body a certain sprightliness and vigor. In consequence, he and the other Sufis in Aden began using the beverage. Then the whole of the people did so. The learned people and the common people followed his example and drank it. So in a way, the whole idea of brewing coffee, of drinking coffee, was initially the brewing of coffee was the coffee fruit, what we call the gishr, uh, or some people know as the kaskara. It's the, it's, the, it's the red bean that surrounds the coffee bean that was initially used and actually was boiled and made into kind of a tea-like beverage, and that was called gahwa al-gishr in Arabic. Uh, but then later on, they decided to start roasting the beans. And in roasting the beans, they found that flavor came out. And then they ground the beans, and then they boiled the beans. And they found that this beautiful elixir, um, this beautiful elixir came out. The amazing thing, of course, was that while coffee began in the Yemen as a social beverage, people outside of those Sufi orders began to see, hmm, what's this thing that everyone's drinking? And so it became commonplace amongst people who are not part of the mystical orders to start to drink coffee. And soon, across the Yemen, coffee drinking became the norm. It became an act of piety and religiosity. So it wasn't long, because the Yemenis are traitors, that coffee began its journey around the world. First, it went to the, it went to the Arabian deserts, to the city of Mecca, which is the great city, holy city of Islam, the birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad. And there, in the precinct of the holy mosque around the Kaaba, the symbolic house of God, people from the Yemen began drinking coffee and sharing it. Because, of course, a place of pilgrimage was a place of pilgrimage for everyone. So the Yemenis would look over at the Egyptians and say, Egyptians, try some of this. And then look over at the Syrians and say, try some of this. And soon, as people came to Mecca, they took stories and sometimes beans back to their home homelands. And soon from Mecca in the early 1500s to Cairo in the early 1500s, we see the emergence of the drinking of coffee. Now, was this without controversy? Of course not, everything has controversy. And every good story has a fatwa. Salman Rushdie, you got nothing on this. So in 1511, coffee is being drunk in the holy precincts of, uh, of Mecca, around the sacred mosque. And so one night, the potentate, the local Mamluk um, the ruler of Mecca, is walking after the evening prayers and, you know, observing his city as it uh, unwinds. And he sees a group of men. They're saying prayers to each other. And he can smell this, this very intoxicating beverage and the smell of it and the cooking of it. And he becomes very worried. 
And he wants to know what this is because he's never been exposed to coffee before. And so this man, whose name was Khair Bey, takes it back to his group of scholars and advisors and says, I've smelt this beverage and I'm worried about it. People are gathering to drink it. Is it something like alcohol? Is it something prohibited? So he calls a great council of scholars. He calls the Persian physicians of the court and they test coffee and they drink it and they deem it to be haram, prohibited. And so the first fatwa against coffee is passed. <laughs> coffee shall no more be drunk in the holy precincts of Mecca. Of course, the fatwa is written in proper script and then sent to Cairo, at that time the seat of Mamluk power. Well, by the time it gets to Cairo and the Sultan sees it, he says hogwash, rips up the fatwa because before Khair Bey even knew it, coffee had already reached Cairo and had become a great and popular beverage in Cairo. And in fact, Khair Bey's story ends very badly. He's... Uh, drawn and quartered when he gets back to Cairo for all kinds of other things that he was, that, that he did. The two physicians are killed by highway robbers and the scholar who gave the fatwa dies a horrible death. This for the people of religion is a sign of coffee's spiritual value. <laughs> you mess with coffee, God messes with you. <laughs> and so while this first fatwa was passed, coffee began to make its way around the world. And really, where coffee becomes truly the magnificent beverage it is, is in the establishment of the coffee house. And the first real coffee houses appear where? But in Constantinople, the capital of the Ottoman Empire. In Constantinople, such is the passion that people have for coffee that while the coffee houses are established in the late 1500s, soon there are coffee houses everywhere. And for every kind of, um, for every kind of uh, personality. And in fact, we have old Ottoman miniature paintings which show what happened in these coffee houses. Coffee houses became places where people would come and read books because of course, books were, had to be handwritten. And so manuscripts were kept in coffee houses so people could come and read them. People would come and listen to stories in the coffee houses because there was the tradition of storytelling. People would come and study in coffee houses. People would receive their news in coffee houses. They'd play backgammon and chess. Coffee houses became a place where, uh, where noble men and noble people and those not so noble would come. And at the heart of the coffee house was the Kavachi Basha, the master of the coffee the person responsible for, for roasting and grinding and brewing the Mohammedan bean to perfection and serving it. And there were certain coffee houses in Constantinople that were known to serve very good coffee and people would wait to enter into their precincts. Why was the coffee house so important? The coffee house arguably is the first truly social institution of sobriety. Taverns have existed since time immemorial, probably. But until very recently, taverns were places you simply went to get drunk. The coffee house was something different. It wasn't a place to get drunk, but it was a place to get high on something else. A beverage that didn't subdue you, but that made you alive, allowed for conversation, allowed for interaction and exchange. If you can imagine in the traditional world where there were no restaurants. There were no shops where one could gather and, 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 and have a cup of tea or coffee. Imagine a world without the coffee house. But imagine as the coffee house enters, outside of the living room, the marketplace, the school, or the mosque, this is the first place where people get together and talk. And they just don't talk about religious stuff. They talk about everything. And that's why coffee was such a threat. And the coffee house was such a threat. In the Ottoman Empire, we know of one of the sultans, one of the caliphs of the Ottoman Empire who banned coffee because he was so worried that people were fomenting revolution inside the coffee houses. He was so adamant about banning coffee, they said if anyone was found drinking coffee, distributing coffee, or trading in coffee, they would be beaten. If they were found again, they would be put in a sack of coffee and drowned in the Bosphorus. Extreme measures which didn't last very long because soon coffee had come to Europe and through Vienna and through Venice and finally to London. And that's where my story ends today. Because if Istanbul, Constantinople was the great beginning of the coffee house, 
then London was the place where the coffee house matured. Many of you will know, and others may not, that at one point in the city of London, there were over 3,000 coffee houses. One scholar says there was a coffee house for every 100 people. And what was the sign of the coffee house? The Turk's head. Very good. The Turk's head was the sign of the coffee house. Why? Because the first coffee house was started by a Greek Orthodox Christian named Pasqua Rose, who had lived in the Ottoman Muslim world, had adopted Ottoman Muslim culture and character, and in the old city of London, just off the Cornhill, began his first coffee house, and he decided to use the Turk's head as the symbol of the cafe. In the same way as one of my friends, Dr. Matthew Green, says so eloquently, in the same way as the Starbucks mermaid now uh, defines for many of us high street coffee, in, in that time of mercantile London, coffee would have meant, if you saw the Turk's head, you knew there was the brew. And of course, it wasn't without controversy. At the time, coffee was considered socially disruptive. There was a women's petition against coffee because uh, they saw, women saw their men going into coffee houses and, and, and spending many long hours in conversation and discussion there. So they said that this was a heathenish liquid, that this was an inkish heathenish brew, they said, and that this is the Turk's curse which has come upon the men of England. Of course, they had a response to that, and coffee wasn't soon banned. It's probably worth mentioning as we close that coffee, all, coffee didn't escape the purview of the Pope himself. Even the Pope was forced to contend with coffee's wild popularity. Catholic priests, of course, warned against the beverage of Islam. They, they said, quote, Satan having forbidden his disciples, the Muslims, to drink wine, certainly because this liquid was sanctified by Christ and was used during communion, he gave them as compensation this infernal black beverage that they called coffee. Well, Pope Clement VIII in 1600 was asked to intervene. And being, of course, a fair-minded man, and we'll give Pope Clement VIII that, he said, well, if you, want to give, if you want my ruling against this beverage, I should taste it, shouldn't I? And indeed, he tasted it and declared, this devil's drink is so delicious, we should cheat the devil by baptizing it. <laughs> and therefore, coffee became, as we would say, halal for Christians as well. What's the point of all these stories? And I could go on and on. The point of these stories is, is that coffee is a gift. And we have to say thank you to the givers of a gift. And I think we all owe a thank you to the Sufis of the Yemen who cultivated coffee, learned how to brew coffee, popularized coffee, and sent it out across the world. Coffee from the Yemen reached every corner of the planet. The story is an incredible story. It's a story of empires and intrigue. It's a, it's a story of stolen beans, and in some cases, stolen lives. But today, coffee is the second most traded commodity in the world. And it's what many of us begin our day with. For madmen like me, it's what I end my day with. Coffee is such an important part of our culture. But the coffee house that it spawned changed the world. And so for me, I, if I had a cup of coffee in my hand, I would certainly raise it. But I ask us all, the next time we have a cup of coffee, that we uh, give a thanks to those great Muslim saints, traders, and um, mystics who first discovered the great properties of what I like to call the Mohammedan bean. Thank you. <laughs>